Our good, good Father has indeed been so very good to us. And in His goodness, He has blessed us with the opportunity to be back together again this week. And we want to assure you that even if you're not able to be here physically in person, we are one in the Holy Spirit. And by the Spirit of God, we are one family in Jesus Christ, and we remain together as one family in Christ because of God's Word. We live in some crazy times, some real, real crazy times. And one of the things that's crazy about the time in which we live is what we are seeking to do with our history. There's a lot of debate right now over the history that has happened in our culture, in our country, and what do we do with it? What do we do with those chapters in our history that were definitely not positive? What do we do with those times in which decisions were made that don't reflect the values that we may have today, but they may have reflected the values of yesteryear? What do we do with that? Do we act like it didn't happen? Do we destroy it? Do we try to tear symbols of it down so that we can try to atone somehow for our sins or the sins of our forefathers? What do we do with our past? And what are we doing right now in the present so that we don't repeat some mistakes of the past? Or what do we do right now so that we can maybe do certain things better in the future? And how do we, and this is the biggest concern I think many of us have, how are we setting ourselves up for the future? What are we teaching our children and our grandchildren? What kind of society will they inherit? What values will shape their upbringing? And what will our nation, what will our nation look like down the line. I certainly think that there's a lot of discussion that needs to take place in our country about what do we do and how can we learn from our history and how can we live in our present and how can we look forward to our future together. It's easy in the midst of the pandemic that we are in to not be able to really look positively towards the future. But thankfully, we have God's promises. We have God's forgiveness and we have God's presence in our lives. And we have all of that because we have the Holy Spirit. You see, my friends, the Spirit of God enables us to look back at the past and to learn from it, to be able to learn from our past, no matter what it was, the good things and the bad things, to, to learn from our past. And the Spirit of God enables us to live in the present, to see today as a gift. It is a gift. That's why they call it the present. It's a gift from God the Father to us. But the Spirit of God also enables us to look forward into the future, and not with despair or feelings of, of dread, but instead to look forward into the future with confidence and with hope because of the promises of God. Romans chapter 8 talks about life by the Spirit. And so today, I want to look at some of these passages, and we will look further in Romans 8 over the next two weeks as well and see what that means for us. Learning from the past, living in the present, looking forward to the future. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. You and I just confessed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a testimony to the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. The Bible says that nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of those who have been baptized into Christ. If you are a baptized follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. And that is a gift of God. You are not of this world. You've been bought with the price of Jesus' blood shed upon the cross. You are not of this world. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. And His work of dwelling in you is to connect you with something that happened in the past so you can live in the present and look forward to the future. And that connection is Him bringing you into Jesus Christ. Earlier in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Paul talked about how that Spirit of God is at work in your baptism. We were therefore buried with Him, that is Jesus, through baptism into death. 
past event, Jesus Christ, 33 A.D., dies upon the cross. He suffers the consequences of our sin. He's murdered by the hands of angry people. But in that murder comes God's atoning work to take our sins away, to suffer the consequences of our disobedient. disobedience. That's the past. Jesus dies. But in the present, you are a baptized child of God, and you're connected with that baptism. And now look what happens in the future. That just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, Easter victory, historical event, happened in the past. We too may live a new life. Right now, by faith, and in the future, face to face with Jesus in glory. You see what the Spirit of God does in you? He connects you to the past. He enables you to live in the present and then look forward to, with hope into the future. That the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit living in your heart, is a present reality. Right now, you have the Holy Spirit who lives in you. You are not your own. You are filled with the living God. But that future fulfillment is what you look forward to. That something's happening right now, but the future, the best is yet to come. The Holy Spirit is described as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. He fills you in the present, but points you towards the future. So let's talk a little bit about the present. Well, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13 says it this way. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. There's something that we need to do. But it is not to the flesh, that is our, our sinful nature, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, according to your sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So what we are called to do in living in the present is to put to death our sinful nature. Not a work that we do on our own, but having been drowned with Christ in our baptisms, we live according to His purpose for us. That if Christ died for sin, we can die to sin. So that if Christ was raised to new life, we then live in that new life. And so our obligation is this. We owe it. We owe it to the one who created our lives. And we owe it to the one who delivered our lives to live the life that he has given to us. We don't have to go and come up with some kind of life. We don't have to just go out searching for what we are called to do, but simply be who we are. To be the children of God, created by the Father, delivered by His Son, dwelt in by the Holy Spirit, that we are obligated, we owe it to God, to live the life that He has given to us. And some people think, well, when you come to faith in Jesus, that means that you have to give up really living your life because you have to give up all of the fun stuff. You have to give up all of the stuff you want to do. And as a matter of fact, it should be just the opposite. That when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, that Spirit doesn't destroy your life. He actually gives you life. The Spirit doesn't destroy our will, but He actually makes us capable of truly willing and of truly doing. So if we believe what the Scripture has truly said, before the Holy Spirit dwelled in our hearts, before faith in Jesus Christ, we were the walking dead. The walking dead. Walking around, seeming to have life, seeming to go through life, but we're walking dead people, dead in our trespasses and sins, until God made us alive so that we can truly walk and truly will and truly do the things that we are called to do to work according to the presence of the Spirit of God in us, to will and to act according to God's good pleasure, to find joy in the things that the Creator has created you to do, to find joy in the fact that you've been delivered from the condemnation of sin and you can live in the freedom of forgiveness, to find joy in the fact that even though the world around us would lead us to despair, the Spirit within us leads us to find hope for the present and into the future. That we owe it to God to live that life. We owe it to Him who has made us alive to will and to do according to His Spirit. Verse 14, 
For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. So when St. Paul is writing this passage here in Romans 8.15, and he refers to this term, Abba, Father, he's not referring to a, a 1970s era band. He's not referring to anything like that. But he's taking an Aramaic term that means dad. Something that a little kid could utter from their mouth even before they could have a grasp over their language. Abba, Abba. Maybe in talking with the kids in our children's message, you thought about your children and some of the first words they may have said. I know that I've heard that from many a mother over the years. That here I am doing most of the diaper changing duty. Here I am doing almost all of the feeding. Here I am being the one to rush to them in the middle of the night when they're crying. And what's the first word to come out of their mouth? Dada. You know? You hear many a mother say that. What? That just isn't right. But it seems to flow out of the kid's mouth. Dada. Or maybe mama. Or maybe like Nathan, my oldest, ba, 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 where everything he saw was a ball. You see, God has said to us in His Word that even from the mouths of infants, God has ordained praise. See, even from the mouths of the littlest kids whom we value here at Mount Olive, God is praised. And the point of using this childlike phrase or word, Abba or Dad, is that God has drawn so near to us in His Son that we have the familiarity of family. That He doesn't care if we get all of our words absolutely right. He doesn't care if we can have great comfort in praying out loud and have this great mastery over the, 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 the jargon of the Christian faith. No. But He simply wants to see us as kids who are coming before their heavenly Dad. And pouring out our souls and pouring out our hearts by the Holy Spirit's power and being able to be drawn into such a close relationship that we see Him as our loving Dad and we see ourselves as His little kids who rely upon His mercy. Yes, the familiarity of family. That is who we are. Dad, Father, we cry out to God. And even when we do not know what to pray for, the Spirit of God enables us to pray in that relationship with God as our Dad. Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit. So the Holy Spirit dwells within you and is testifying with your spirit, that part of you that you, you can't see with the eyes, but it's there, your soul, your spirit. And what's the testimony? You're God's children. And if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. So we've got the past events that we've been connected to. We have the, the present. We are living and willing according to God's work in us. And now the future. The Holy Spirit confirms in us the new reality that our present and our future are secure in Jesus Christ. I hope that you know with great confidence that through faith in Jesus Christ, you have a future that is secure. You don't have to worry about what is in store for you. But through faith in Jesus Christ, you have a glorious inheritance in heaven that's being prepared for you. That God has prepared for you eternal life in His Son, Jesus Christ. And you are secure in Jesus Christ. Because why? You're a child of God. I am a child of God. And if you say, I am a child of God, you say, I'm an heir of the promises of God. I I'm going to be given a glorious inheritance in heaven. And in order for an inheritance to be received, someone dies, correct? Someone dies so that an inheritance can be given. And that is the beautiful thing. We already know that that death has taken place. That the death of God's Son, Jesus Christ, has secured that for us. 
that his death has already paid the penalty for our sins and has already secured our eternal life so that what has happened in the past can give us confidence in the present and also give us that security into the future that already waiting for me is a glorious inheritance in Jesus Christ. Why? Because I'm a child of God and I'm an heir of his promise. Friends, I hope that you will remember that today, that you will hold that close in your heart today, and that you will remember the power that comes from being a child of God and being filled with the Spirit. And in conclusion, we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and remind ourselves of all that God has promised to us by His Spirit. And so wherever you are right now, whether you're seated in this room here at Mount Olive, or you're seated in your living room or in your bedroom or wherever you're watching online, would you please join with me and let's read together these promises of God that enable us to learn from our past and live in the present and look forward to the future. Let's read together Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Amen.